This is the first week of a new series called Jesus and, Jesus and, where we are looking at what does Jesus think about all the issues that we're facing in contemporary Christianity? What does it mean to be a Jesus follower in all the tricky circumstances of the last couple of years? Over the last couple of years, I've made a little list of, ooh, we should talk about that one day, or we should talk about that one day. And what does Jesus think about race and politics and justice? What does Jesus think about moral relativism? What does Jesus think about all these things? And I've been saving them up. Hopefully someone else will preach to them, but I guess it's my job to preach around here. So we are starting a series called Jesus And, looking at all of these issues over the next two months. And so a great journey ahead. And today... We are beginning to set the scene with this new series by looking at Jesus and this cultural moment. Jesus and this cultural moment. We're living in a unique cultural moment. We feel it, don't we? Over the last couple of years in particular, things have accelerated where we're now grappling with what it means to be a Jesus follower in a postmodern society, in a post-truth society, in a post-Christian society. What does it mean where we see that the culture wars are stronger than ever, what does it mean to follow Jesus in this unique cultural moment? In my research over the last couple of weeks, I've read a lot, more than the last couple of weeks, but really dived back in the last couple of weeks. And as I try and give an overview, broad brushstrokes of why we are here, why all these things are happening today, I want to recognize that I'm only going to be giving broad brushstrokes. I'm only going to be giving like a skimming a rock across the surface of these things. I mean, Charles Taylor's book, The Secular Age, is about 860 pages. So, you know, I'm only going to give it a little skip of a rock over the top. So be gracious with me. There's going to be some things that you go, well, but what about this? There's always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be nuances. I'm going to give you the 80 for 20, and hopefully that will help us further dialogue and discuss these issues. If you want to go deeper, here are some resources that helped me and helped me as a Jesus follower understand why we face the things that we face today. I call these ones chunky because you need a good shot of double espresso to read these ones. Um, How Not to Be Secular, James K.A. Smith. That's a summary of the larger um, Charles Taylor work, about 850 pages on this secular age. Cultural Apologetics, Paul Gould, and the recent one, which is, I read recently, very helpful, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Carl Truman, particularly looking at the sexual ethics and revolution of today. Uh, if you don't fancy reading uh, I'm Getting a Headache, then there's easier resources. Two of our friends here have written some good books recently that you can read um, over just a light spritzer. Those are Live No Lies with John Mark Comer, a really brilliant summary. It only was released a couple of days ago, so please do read that. And Beautiful Resistance by John Tyson. These things are much easier to digest for the likes of me, and so hopefully they are for you as well. And then The Most Essential Podcast that I think we should all be listening to is This Cultural Moment by John Mark Comer and Mark Sayers. And it was released a couple of years ago. Uh, it's stopped now, but there's three seasons worth, and it's really fascinating to, to listen to that in the car, on the treadmill, the peloton, or walking your Labradors like I do every morning. So please do dive into them. But how do we understand this cultural moment? I want to begin by sharing two metaphors that I believe will help us understand this cultural moment. The first is a metaphor taken from the work of Jewish sociologist Philip Reif. It's a metaphor of breaking the cord, breaking the rope. Philip Reif, who's no longer with us, analyzed incredibly well historical culture and movements and showed that there's been a progression of cultures from first culture second culture, to today's third culture. He says first culture was the paganism culture, pre-religion, where the world was dominated by spiritual forces of fate and these forces that we didn't have a real relationship with, but these were the pagan cultures of pre-religion. They were linked to some kind of external sacred reality. Things moved on, and the second culture was still linked to this sacred reality, but it was more defined. Fate was replaced by faith in some religious system, whether it be Christianity or whether it be Islam 
or Judaism. Religion became the norms by which societies would be shaped. And so that's moving from, so to speak, a pre-Christian to a Christian culture in our country. But Philip Reef talks about something significant happening in the Enlightenment around the 17th and 18th century when reason replaced the sacred core. There was a fundamental schism that we would now define ourselves no longer by the cord connecting us to the sacred, the external sacred, that we would break the cord, that we would now start to live into life without any transcendent cord connecting us. This is what he calls third culture. There's nothing out there, despite the X-Files, there's nothing out there that we are to define ourselves by what's in here. And so the word secular came, and anti-culture, in the sense that this culture is defined as not the first or second. Whereas the second was a progress from the first, the third is anti-first and second. We want to reject first and second culture, reject religion, reject these things, because we don't want to define anything within our, our reality based on anything external. So this is what we would then call a post-Christian culture. Secularism is the defining understanding of this third culture. Secularism is defined by Charles Taylor as the attempt to create a system for human flourishing in which the presence of God is absent. In other words, good without God. Or in the Christian, post-Christian world, the kingdom without the king that we want to live into the ethics of the Judeo-Christian value system, but without Jesus. Charles Taylor writes this. He says, I'm in the understanding of life which emerges with a romantic expressivism of the late 18th century, that each one of us has his or her or their own way of realizing our humanity, and that it's important to find a life out of one's own as against surrendering to a conformity with a model imposed on us from outside by society or the previous generation or religious or political authority. So this breaking the cord that Philip Reef talks about leaves us in a reality that is self-defined. That we've broken the cord from any external transcendence. The next metaphor that Charles Taylor pushes into in particular is very helpful to, to, to define then the reality of what it's like to live in this third culture where we've broken the cord from the sacred. And he uses the word imminent frame to describe that reality, the imminent frame. Or as Paul Gould describes it, the dungeon. The dungeon because we step into this cave that nothing can penetrate. Nothing external at all can penetrate. Our job in life is to make much of the cave that we've been given. The imminent frame is, for Charles Taylor, we, our life is defined by imminence only. It's what my feelings are, why my experiences are, what my things are. That life now has its value and its meaning and significance only in what is in front of us. And therefore, we have a, a line, a, a cave, and anything outside of that we push against. We push against society, um, telling us what to do, traditions forming us and telling us you've got to be this, you've got to be that. Any family expectations, it's like, no, I'm going to be myself. Authority structures, no one can tell me how to live. Moral absolutes, well, that's your definition of morality, not mine. Religion, biology, it's like not even biology now that once used to frame our existence. Now with the advance of science and technology, we can manipulate our biology to re represent who I want to be in my feelings as opposed to what my biology says I am. Duty and obedience is an external opposition and um, uh, code that we have to uh, abide by. And it's like, well, I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that. Geography. We once, if you were born 300 years ago, you kind of had to stay where you were born. Um, but now with the advance of travel and science and technology, we can move in the world wherever we want. Social constructs like marriage and parenthood can be redefined fully around who I want to be. I am the master of my own cave, dungeon. 
As one author put it, we are born into this world where the world is a blank canvas upon which we are to paint our self-expression. That we are to be fully who we are. Therefore, we emphasize our own rights versus responsibilities. My feelings, regardless of what other people think. My morality. I've got to pursue happiness. I've got to make this cave the most exciting, enjoyable place to be. Pursue my own happiness. Therefore, I'm going to look to new idols, things that are here, and I'm going to worship them. So consumerism takes place. Materialism takes over. The endorphin hit when we get a new iPhone, as it used to be, maybe not nowadays. But we make much of things today as the new idols of the imminent frame. My spirituality, even spirituality has been reduced to something that we are in charge of, the authentic, autonomous self that is fully authoritative over our world will even reduce spirituality to that. We'll go, I think in my dungeon, in my imminent frame, I'd love to have some connection to spirituality, therefore I will decide what that is. I will determine a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of this, a bit of that, that will work for me, but if it's externally something I don't agree with, then I'll just reject it. Everything is under my authority. This is the worldview of our city. This is the worldview of people in our culture today, that we live in the radicalized, individualized self, where we are defining the world without any reference to anything else. Therefore, you will hear all these sayings every day because it makes sense of this is how we're living. So you'll hear these sayings such as, you know, it's all good. You know, I'm not going to judge your dungeon. It's all good, bro. I'm just going to define my reality, my imminent frame. You do you, living my truth. Whatever you do, make sure you do it for you. Nothing is wrong if it feels good. Emotivism, is the, which is your feelings, defines morality in your world. If it feels good, do it. Do you. And then if anybody does object, it's like, hey, haters are going to hate. Haters are going to hate. You are outside of my imminent frame, and therefore I don't need to respond because I'm enjoying my authentic best self. Charles Taylor sums it as, summarizes this as, this is the age of authenticity. Your life is defined fully by your feelings. This is the promise then of secularism and the third culture in which we live in. That you can be good without God. You can have human flourishing if you reject anything but live fully into your feelings. And even the, the values and morals of the Judeo-Christian environment we've grown up in in this country about justice and mercy and love and kindness and humility... We want to adopt those still. We love those. We think kind of that would be pretty cool. But whereas in the Bible they're talked about these are the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life, we've replaced the Spirit with this is the fruit of me. I don't need God to be good. And therefore we create fictional TV characters that we go, look, we can prove that this will work. We can get rid of God and we can prove that we can be the people we long to be. And there's so many examples of this. The most recent one, of course, is Ted Lasso, which, if you've seen that show, is like this guy personifies, oh, my word, you believe in people. You're forgiving to people. You're encouraging people. We all want to be you. And Ted Lasso shows us that we don't have to have any faith in the transcendent to be this type of person. This is the cultural moment that we're living in, where the authority is now residing in the self. This is why, of course, as followers of Jesus, we feel kind of a headwind. We feel rejected. We feel ostracized because third culture is anti-second culture. You can't have two competing authorities. That Christianity says, actually, Jesus doesn't fit in this authoritative structure He is the king over all things. He's the creator. He's the God over all things. And the good life for Jesus is to surrender your own crown and follow him. But in a world where individual is crowned king, you can't have two kings living at peace with each other. Me versus Jesus. 
And therefore, Christians will increasingly be ostracized because we are preaching that actually Jesus himself is the king, and therefore there's an accountability to that. There's an authority to that. There's actually an intolerance from a Jesus perspective of any other gods. And therefore, Jesus, the claims of authentic Christianity fully are at war with the claims of the radicalized individual. And therefore, what Christians find is that we're increasingly moving from majority to minority. We're increasingly going from faith in the public square just to keep it to yourself because it's dangerous for employment. It's dangerous to what we're trying to achieve in our workplace or in our culture. It's going against the values that we're trying to espouse. We're trying to espouse good without God, and here you are doing something else. Just keep it to yourself. And then, of course, we're moving from respected to disrespected. As people start to go, you know what? I don't even want the things that Jesus is bringing around morality and ethics. We actually don't believe that human life is flourishing in the way of Jesus. And so Christianity is one of those things where as Jesus' followers, we're starting to experience the headwind and opposition that comes with following Jesus faithfully. And the thing that every friend of mine who is not a Jesus follower, I've had this all of my life and happens to say, I love my friends who aren't Jesus followers, but what they will try and do is say to me, oh, come on, Gare. Jesus sounds amazing if he will just come under my authority. That sounds amazing, but don't ask me to come under his. And there's this wrestle. And you are increasingly finding that wrestle. A friend of mine recently was employed at an investment bank. And the fact on his Facebook social media post, the fact that he was a Jesus follower, was then probed to such a degree that they were saying, promise, we can only hire you if you never bring this into the workplace. Then it's a threat. And the problem that society has, of course, is what do we do with this message of Jesus? Because it doesn't seem that this promise of secularism is working. Our city is waking up, and Philip Reef spoke about this. He said, this is all fine and good, and there's a, the good news of secularism and the autonomous self that promises all these things. But what we're, trying to, what we're waking up to is actually it's making things worse. And the question that we have to ask is, is it working? Is it working? Of course, I'm the first to say I am so thankful for advances in education, in science, technology. I'm so happy that we are actually free from some tyrannical authorities that don't allow us freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and freedom to actually choose a career that is more defined by who we are than just what our dads and and mothers did. I'm really glad that we have more of those options. But the question is, these freedoms and these tools of technology and education, etc., in the hands of the autonomous self, is it producing human flourishing? Is it working? And as we come out of COVID and as we look at the world around us, what we see and what we've, it, people are starting to admit is it isn't delivering on the promise that it gives. There's a crisis all around us in the world of the autonomous self. There's a crisis of meaning and purpose. There's a crisis of, man, I'm making much of all the things in my life and shopping and sex and relationships and career and money, leisure, pleasure, treasure. But there's a crisis because these material things, we're trying to find a transcendent fullness, and yet they were never designed for that. And people are still feeling empty and without meaning. I have the privilege of being in an alpha group, and you may be in my alpha group here, which is awesome people who are humbly and bravely investigating faith in Jesus. But one thing that we were all talking about this last week is, and I was just listening to them, but they all agreed that actually, yeah, we all feel what they called the void, something missing. Because there is no bigger story for us to live into. There is no reason why I exist. There is no purpose behind my existence. In the imminent frame, I'm just an accident trying to make 
the most of my personal happiness in this fleeting life. There's also a crisis of identity and validation that if you're not going to get your validation from external things, because you have to be you, and it's all good. There's no objective standard whether you're succeeding or not, whether you're doing well or not. It's just you be you, and let the haters hate. And so we're craving for this self-confidence of, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks, that I just need to be my authentic self and I'll be happy and significant and I will be at peace. The problem is we weren't designed to be outside of any external acceptance. We were designed communally. We were designed by God the Father who said to God the Son, well done, good and faithful servant. We are designed to fit into a story where there is reward and there's joy and there's peace and there's celebration. But we're living in this imminent frame where nothing of that is there. And we're told we don't need it. And yet what do we find ourselves doing is craving it. And betraying our authenticity in order to get it. And so we have this thing called social media that we will be our most unauthentic self to get the most likes from other people. We'll betray our very philosophical ideology of you be you and doesn't matter what anybody thinks and yet social media is exactly the opposite because we have a crisis that we can't self-validate. We were never meant to be self-validating. Crisis of community. If we're all living in these imminent frames, that we've grown up in these imminent frames where muscle memory is about making much of us, pursuing our own happiness, having friendships that are utilitarian around what they'll do for me, then when a rubber hits the road, when bumps inevitably happen with relationships, we have no means to survive the bump in the road. We have no toolkit of commitment, loyalty, tenacity when our feelings have gone, self-sacrifice, preferring others above ourselves. All the things that Jesus says, this is the toolkit for a relationship, the imminent frame never disciples in the, us in those things. And therefore, friendships are purely utilitarian. While your imminent frame and my imminent frame overlap in the same way that we want to pursue the same things, we'll journey together. We isolate more and more into communities that are just like us because actually we journey together towards the same goals in life. And diversity is gone. And then marriage, which was in the biblical definition, two complementary different people coming together into one new world. And you're committed in all the ups and downs of life. Now marriage is, you're just like me. I'm really physically attracted to you. And we both like the same things. But once you're no longer attractive, and once we may not like the same things anymore, then there's no way that we can stay together. In fact, it would be wrong to stay together. Because I'm not helping you find your best self. And you're not helping me find my best self. Because our best self is the, the prize of life. And so someone can divorce someone reluctantly thinking it's in their best interest to divorce them. Because I no longer will help them pursue happiness in their imminent frame. It's a crisis of community. And so L.A., is lots of lonely people longing to belong, but with no toolkit to do so. There are so many things that are screaming the crisis of this age. That secular, secularism is a gospel. It's proclaiming a good news that if you just put yourself first and define all of these things your own way, then you will find the flourishing and the authentic self that you desire. But we're waking up to reality that it overpromises and underdelivers. We can't have the good without God. We weren't designed to be. And we certainly can't have the kingdom without the king. So how do we move forward? How do we respond? How do we move forward in this cultural moment? At the same time as there's a crisis in culture of this is not working, and parallel to that, 
The church is facing more opposition than it has in a generation. At least a generation. Where being a Christian is increasingly ostracized, irrelevant, mocked, and estranged. How do we move forward? Well, there are, of course, various responses we see in our culture today. I want to isolate a few of them. First is fear and self-preservation. Fear and self-preservation. Let's protect the second culture that we had. Let's fight. Let's protect. Let's preserve. Let's dominate so we don't lose the privileged status we've had in society. Let's impose our morality on others, whether they like it or not. Because we're afraid. We're fearful. We turn the word Christian from a noun into an adjective. I'm a Christian, now becomes, I go to Christian schools, I go to Christian employment, I live in a Christian city, I drive Christian cars, whatever that may be. I listen to Christian radio, I follow Christians on Instagram. We put up a virtual bubble where we are preserving our way of life. The problem is, this is not the way of Jesus. In John chapter 17, the disciples overheard Jesus praying to his Father, and he prayed this. He said, they are not of the world any more than I am of the world, but my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of the world, but sanctify them by the truth. And as you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. We are not in our fear to retreat. We are not in our fear and the opposition to turn to power and domination. So what do we do? Well, others around choose a different option, which is to compromise. Is to compromise. Is to say, oh, yeah, you know, Christianity has to keep up with the times. We have to keep in step. We can't be on the wrong side of history. We need to actually re realize that you know, some biblical interpretations of, of some things need to change. The Bible contains truth. It's not the truth. It's a very subtle difference. That we have now the intellect, because of progressive intellect, science, and technology, to search the Scriptures for truth and to leave some stuff behind. It so happens that we leave stuff behind that we just don't like. It's very convenient. And so compromise is what so many people are doing. It's called the deconstruction movement. We need to deconstruct some things in the church that should not be in the church. Let me just say that. That are not like Jesus. But people go further and start to deconstruct the things of Jesus in order to be popular, in order to grow, in order not to be ostracized from relationships, not to suffer persecution. We are seeking to compromise. The problem is, of course, if you take Jesus out of Christianity, Jesus does leave Christianity. And you're left with empty buildings with a set of morals that fit with a culture when they were established but no longer fit. And the presence of God has left the room. If you look in the Old Testament, you'll see whenever there was compromise of the Jewish community to the cultures of the world, the first thing to, to go was the presence of God from the temple. And there has been no, if you look over church history, there's been no liberal, progressive, reinterpreting Jesus' words movement that has ever survived. That's not because they're not great leaders or great communicators. They have their own songs. But you'll never survive if Jesus leaves the room. And so it's tempting to go to churches where it's go, oh, it's really easy to be a Christian here because culture doesn't oppose me if I go here. The problem is it's lost its power. It's lost the very thing that the church longs for, which is the presence of Jesus. All this syncretism. The final option is syncretism. You know, it's a bit of this, a bit of that. We'll merge Jesus with a bit of this and a bit of that. And we'll domesticate Jesus fundamentally that he fits within our world. He fits within our authority structures, which is me. And this has actually invaded the church significantly over the last 20, 30 years. In order to make Jesus attractional to others, 
in order to remove obstacles, that perceived obstacles for coming to faith, we've reduced the claims of Jesus to what non-Christians would like. So instead of Jesus saying to his disciples, surrender, deny yourself, and the good life comes when you take off your own crown and follow me, and then you'll find that I am the author of all life. I've come to give you life and life in the full, but it comes through abandoning of your own self and worshiping me. Remember those verses, you'll, lose, when you'll gain your life when you lose it? Jesus is talking about this imminent frame. He's saying, look, so long as you're in this imminent frame, you can't actually experience the life I have for you because I'm outside of your imminent frame. But what we try and do is go, oh, Jesus, but that's too much. Wouldn't it be great if you would come inside our box, allow us to keep the crown, and you just do and give us the blessings and the life stuff without me having to give up my crown? Chris Smith wrote a book called Soul Searching, which he interviewed. It was the largest study ever conducted of teenage Christians in the mid-2000s. And we're living in the fruit of that today, where he realized that this is the primary definition of God amongst American teenagers in church, that Jesus is no longer someone with the crown and the creator of all things, that by love comes and rescues us from the depravity and the emptiness of the imminent frame and calls us to follow him for life. In fact, what we want is to make Jesus some kind of, and he puts this, cosmic butler who will come into our world and just give us what we want, when we want it and never talks back, and never disagrees with us. And I, I'm afraid, I look at my own life, have I been guilty of preaching Jesus this way? Have I been guilty of leading people to give their lives to Jesus in some kind of, and he'll be your cosmic butler? And then when, people, when Jesus disappoints people, they go, hang on a minute, why is Jesus letting this happen to me? I thought everything he would do was basically give me everything I ever wanted. There must be a better way than self-preservation. There must be a better way than compromise. There must be a better way than syncretism. And it's the way that Jesus describes himself. That if we are to move forward with hope and confidence into this next season, Jesus gives us the roadmap of how to live in this cultural moment. It's in Matthew chapter 5. It's straight after the Beatitudes. He says this. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus calls his church in this cultural moment to be salt and light. I was joking with a friend, not salty and lit, but salt and light. Salt and light. And the first thing we see here is that we are to be missionaries. Salt doesn't do its job if it stays in the salt shaker. We can't retreat we can't hide, but we have to get out of the salt shaker. We have to be missionaries in our context. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus said to his, to his disciples, Now go, I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit so you may go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And we often think missionaries are the end of the world bit, but Jesus says missionaries begin in Jerusalem, at home that you are the people I'm sending into your workplaces, into your colleges, into your studios, into your neighborhoods. That we often think of missionaries as people who go, but missionaries are also those who stay. Stay for the sake of our city. To go and show that Jesus is the way to the good life that he is beautiful, that he is good, that he is true, that when you're proximate to people who are trying their best to find that transcendence in the imminent frame, that they're trying to find goodness and beauty in the imminent frame, eventually it, they'll realize, they'll hit rock bottom and go, it's not here. 
and they'll see someone next to them in their cubicle, in their car, who models a different way of living, the way of Jesus. And that's His way leads to the fulfillment of meaning and goodness and beauty that we long for. We are missionaries. Secondly, we are to be discipled. Jesus says very clearly, salt can lose its saltiness. Salt can lose its saltiness. You're, you're no good when you're sent out as missionaries if you look just like the world we are supposed to witness to. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, you are to be my witnesses. And therefore, we have to do such a great job individually and together to be radical Jesus followers, to be discipled in what we do, to represent him in the streets and in our workplaces, to be like him in these things. It says in this passage, Jesus says, when people see your good deeds, then they'll wake up and go, there must be something more. I'm going to talk about this next week a lot more, but we have so been afraid of legalism in the American church. We, have, we are so afraid of reducing grace to law that we have no understanding and no apparatus for any reason to be holy in contemporary Christianity. Jesus saved me, I'm off to heaven. And praise the Lord, whatever I do, he forgives. Now that's true, but heresy is not often saying something that's wrong, it's missing something out. And the missing out there is Jesus saying, I've called you to a different way of life, the way of the kingdom, the way that now you follow me with your time and your money and your, your bodies, that actually you're going to live into the good life. You're going to discover that my ways in all of these things lead to joy and peace and well-being. And it's when the world sees that you're living into a totally different way of living, the Jesus way of living, they'll go, that's what I long for. I'm so glad of people like John Mark Homer and others who are calling a new generation in the Christian church, not just to believe in Jesus, but to follow the way of Jesus. Rediscovering patterns of life that are around him, of generosity and Sabbath and the unhurried life, the life that actually prefers others above ourselves. All these things that we go, okay, don't preach legalism, but for the sake of the world, we need to show them that the way of Jesus is good, beautiful, and true. We need to be salty, salt. Thirdly, we need to be resilient. You will be opposed. As disciples of Jesus, we're going to, I believe, go into an era where we are persecuted. Maybe not physically, but socially, economically, relationally. Many of you today, you told me, you're feeling that already. I know people in this room have lost their jobs because of their faith. That will just become more and more. And i actually not afraid of that. And actually, Jesus says, well, did you read the bit before what I just said? Because in Matthew chapter 5, immediately before he, him talking about salt and light, he says this, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We need to lean into the teachings of Jesus that mean in opposition we are resilient. We're still loving, we're gracious, we're humble, but we're unshakable. That we don't panic and go, hang on a minute, Jesus, where are you? Where's my breakthrough? Where's my job? I thought this, you were going to promise me a thing. I'm out. It's like, what kind of Jesus were you worshiping anyway? But whereas the disciples came to him, Matthew chapter 9, they said, this is hard teaching. And he said, are you guys going to leave? And they said, where else would we go? For only you have the words of eternal life. Resilience in the face of opposition. And let me just say, resilience is loving and gracious, not obnoxious and arrogant. Just, just to say that. And then finally, together. 
Salt only works when there's a lot of it. <laughs> and we are to be together as a community, supporting and loving each other, there for each other. In Acts 2.42, it says, this is the early church, and it describes a church that's caring for each other, looking out for each other, helping each other, because we can't go into battle alone. No advance of the kingdom goes unopposed. And you know as well as I do, when we step out alone, we can feel the currents drifting us away. We are to be together. But Garrett, as we land the plane here, as we come to communion, what's the one word that I have in my heart? As we lean into this next future, when culture is going through such a strange moment and the church is more disrespected and oppressed as ever before, what's the one word I have? As vintage may shrink, we may suffer persecution, what's the one word I have? And the one word is this, hopeful. Hopeful. I actually think this is the best time to be a Christian. I think it's the best time. God, in his sovereignty, chose you to be born into this cultural moment to be salt and light, that the light shines brightest in the darkness. And man, what's the point of salt if there's nothing to salt? What an opportunity we each have to be salt and light for Jesus. Leslie Newbigin, who was a missionary to India and then to England, was asked the question, are you depressed about the future ahead? And he said this, he said, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. You know, what he was saying is the future isn't my concern. I'm not afraid of it. I don't think much of it or less of it because Jesus is risen from the dead. And that means he's in charge. He is the king of all kings. He's defeated sin and death and Satan. He reigns victorious. He wasn't surprised by anything that we're seeing today. And guess what? He knows the end outcome, which is of his kingdom there will be no end. That grace and love and mercy will fill the streets of this world as King Jesus comes and renews all things in his name. We know the end. And we're living in one of the many battles, but the war has been won. A friend of mine reminded us that, Gare, we can be hopeful because whenever we enter into these types of seasons, it's only an opportunity for a fresh move of God. It's a fresh move of God to fill the streets. We can't do it on our own strength, but we've been here before. Whenever the church is pruned, it's always because there's a harvest coming. He said, remember the 60s. Remember how bleak the 60s were. He says, remember the sexual revolution in Woodstock? All the parents from the 40s and 50s of going, the end has come. Remember how bleak it was with the Bay of Pigs standoff and the fear of global communism and nuclear destruction just around the corner? Do you remember the ongoing ache and pain of the Vietnam War? Do you remember the upheaval, the beautiful upheaval of the civil rights movement? shaking up all of our society. Then you remember the tragedy. Every couple of years, there's another assassination of one of the key leaders. From JFK, then to Malcolm X, then to Bob Kennedy, then to Martin Luther King himself. Imagine how we all felt at the end of the 60s, thinking the end has come. There's no way. We were not hopeful. What is God going to do? Has he gone? Is he absent? Is this it? And then a few people prayed. A few people held out that Jesus is king and a fresh move of the Holy Spirit filled our nation. He said, do you remember the beaches of Santa Monica lined with the hippies of the age in the Jesus movement waiting to be baptized in the name of King Jesus? These same people who realized that the sexual revolution was not all it was cracked up to be. These same people were in their thousands coming to know Jesus. Many of you may be in the room today as a fruit of that movement. I was read in Time magazine up there on the right of that image. 1971 edition said this, it is a startling development for a generation that has been constantly accused of tripping out or copping out with sex, drugs and, now, and violence 
that they now embrace the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness, and brotherly love in the history of Western man. They are afire with a Pentecostal passion for sharing their new vision with others. Fresh-faced, wide-eyed young girls and earnest young men badger businessmen and shoppers on Hollywood Boulevard, witnessing for Christ with breathless exhortation. I think we're ready, and God is preparing us for another Jesus movement. The future is hopeful, because Jesus is in charge. He's defeated our enemies. And with love and grace and mercy, He will pour out His Spirit once again to rescue people from the emptiness of the imminent frame and bring them back under His gracious rule and reign to the place they were created. Let's stand together.